Turkish pro-government newspaper Sabah said it has identified 15 intelligence team it has said to be involved in the disappearance of prominent Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi. Khashoggi was last seen a week ago entering the consulate in Istanbul to get documents relating to his forthcoming marriage. His fiancée waited outside said he never emerged and Turkish sources said they believe Khashoggi, a prominent critic of Saudi policies, was killed inside the mission. He's giving away many of the matters that were hindering Saudi Arabia and it is good like giving women more rights, allowing women to drive, uh, allowing uh, the right of people for happiness and entertainment, uh, fighting corruption, which is also good. But he is also maintaining the old ways of repressive system. Actually, he's expanding at that. And he's totally, totally, he doesn't need it. There is no opposition to him. I just don't understand why does he have to go this harsh method or harsh ways of uh, previous Arab leaders when he doesn't have an opposition really the people whom he's arresting are not an opposition most of them are supportive for, supportive of his reform few uh, traditional <laughs> will oppose to women driving and women's rights but I would say 95% of the people who he arrested in September are reformists. Abba newspaper published the names and year of birth of 15 Saudis it said arrived at Istanbul airport on the 2nd of October. 12 of them arrived early on Tuesday based on photos captured at passport control which it published. The 15 departed at four different times, Saba has reported. Mishal Saad Al Bostani, born 1987. Salah Mohammed Tubegi, born 1971. There's a woman behind him. We can't be sure whether she's related. Badr, and then the final picture, Saif Saad Al Kahtani, born 1973, stayed at the Movan Pick Hotel. As per a Turkish media report, it reportedly took seven minutes to kill Saudi journalist Jamal Khashoggi inside of the Saudi consulate. The Miz were probing as to what happened to the Saudi journalist inside of the Saudi consulate and the details are very chilling. Now, a Turkish source claims to have heard the audio recording of Khashoggi's dying moments. The source also has said that Khashoggi was dragged from the consul general's office in the consulate in Istanbul and onto a table of his study next door. The horrendous screams were then heard by a witness downstairs. It is believed that Khashoggi's body was dismembered while he was still alive. Now it was a 15-member squad which arrived in Ankara on a private jet on the 2nd of October to perform this task. The Salah Muhammad al tubagi was part of the squad, squad that dismembered Khashoggi's body on the table. He's been identified as the head of the foreign evidence in Saudi security department. The screaming stopped when Khashoggi was injected with an so far unknown substance as he started as this in Istanbul on the day journalist Jamal Khashoggi disappeared. The video was given to the post by a person familiar with the Turkish government's investigation. It was later published by a Turkish television station. The heavily edited footage was compiled by Turkish authorities. At some points in the footage, you can see what appears to be original timestamps. It also at times appears the video we see was recorded from a computer screen. The post has blurred the faces of the men the video claims are Saudis because we are unable to independently identify the men. The footage was edited and subtitled in Turkish before it was obtained by the post. The video opens with what it says are still images of a private jet at an airport in Turkey in the early hours of October 2nd. Subtitles say nine people arrived on this flight. It then claims to show individuals entering and leaving two different Istanbul hotels, the Movenpick Hotel and the Windham Grand. 
The timestamps and subtitles on the footage show dates and times on both October 1st and October 2nd, not always in chronological order. The Movin Pic Hotel, Istanbul, is a short drive from the Saudi consulate. The video then shows Khashoggi arriving at the Saudi consulate. The timestamp, which the creators of the video have highlighted in red, reads 1.14 p.m., October 2nd, which is when post-reporting puts him at the consulate. The video then claims to show two vehicles leaving the consulate about two hours later. A screen grab of a map purports to show the route one of the vehicles took from the consulate to the Saudi Consul General's residence. The subtitles then say a vehicle with the same license plate is shown arriving at the Consul General's residence and entering the garage. The post cannot confirm the license plate numbers. But something is off. The timestamp on the residence footage reads one minute before the timestamp on the consulate footage. The next scene claims to show Khashoggi's fiance in front of the consulate at 5.33 p.m. The video jumps forward in time, claiming to show the Saudi men leaving a hotel between 7.57 p.m. and 8.11 p.m. on October 2nd. Still images of a runway with planes circled are said to show two private jets leaving the airport around 5.40 p.m. and 9.00 p.m. on October 2nd. The video claims 13 individuals departed on these flights, 6 in one group and 7 in the second. Saudi officials did not respond to requests for comment. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Assalamu alaikum. Lovely to see you all here tonight. We are having a very entertaining night, are we not? With some very interesting things being said uh, from the other side of the house tonight. Um, let me begin by saying, as a Muslim, as a representative of Islam, I would consider myself an ambassador for Islam, a believer in Islam, a follower of Islam and its prophet. So, in that capacity, let me begin by apologizing to Anne-Marie for the Bali bombings. I apologize for the role of my religion and me and my people, uh, for the killing of Theo van Gogh, for 7-7. Seven, seven. Yes, that was all of us. That was Islam, that was Muslims, that was the Quran. I mean, astonishing, astonishing claims uh, to make in the very first speech tonight, on a day like today, where the conservative Prime Minister of the United Kingdom is having to come out and point out that these kind of views are anathema. And I believe you're trying to stand for the Labour Party to become an MP in Brighton. If you do uh, and you make these comments, I'm guessing you'll have the whip withdrawn from you. But then again, UKIP's on the rise. They'll take you, the BNP. They might have uh, something to say about your views. <laughs> what Hassan always does. By the way, always by the way, 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 by the way just on a factual do. point, since we heard a lot about the second speaker, about how backward we Muslims all are. On a factual point, you said that Islam was born in Saudi Arabia. Islam was born in 610 AD. Saudi Arabia was born in 1932 AD. So you were only 1,322 years off. Not bad? Not bad start there. Uh, talking of maths, by the way, a man named Al Qawarizmi was one of the greatest mathematicians of all time, a Muslim, worked in the golden age of Islam. He's the guy who came up with not just algebra, but algorithms. Without algorithms, you wouldn't have laptops. Without laptops, 
Daniel Johnson tonight wouldn't have been able to print out his speech in which he came to berate us Muslims for holding back the advance and intellectual achievements of the West, which all happened without any contribution from anyone else other than the Judeo-Christian people of Europe. In fact, Daniel David Levering, the author of the Pulitzer Prize winning historian and author of The Golden Crucible, points out that there would be no Renaissance, there would be no Reformation in Europe without the role played by Ibn Sina and Ibn Rushd and some of the great Muslim theologians, philosophers, scientists in bringing Greek text to Europe. As for this being our university, I will leave that to the imagination as to who is our and who is there. Uh, I studied here too. Um, an astonishing, astonishing set of uh, speeches so far making this case tonight. Uh, a mixture of just cherry-picked quotes, facts and figures, self-serving, selective, a farrago of distortions, misrepresentations, misinterpretations, misquotations. Uh, Daniel talked about my article in the New Statesman, which got me a lot of flack, where I talked about the anti-Semitism that is prevalent in some parts of the Muslim community, which indeed it is. Uh, of course, I didn't say in that piece that it was caused by the religion of Islam. In fact, uh, modern anti-Semitism in the Middle East was imported from, finish the sentence, Christian, Judeo-Christian Europe, where I believe some certainly bad things happened to the Jewish people. In fact, Tom Friedman, Jewish-American columnist in the New York Times, told me in this very chamber last week that he believed, had Muslims been running Europe in the 1940s, six million extra Jews would still be alive today. So I'm not going to take lessons in anti-Semitism from someone who's here to defend the Judeo-Christian values of a continent that murdered six million Jews. Uh, moving swiftly on. Moving swiftly on. Yes. Absolutely. Well, I'm about to make that point. No, 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 I'm about to make that point. You're right. I agree with you. I agree with you. I agree with you 110%. That is my point. I don't think Europe is evil or bad. I'm a very proud European. I don't want to judge Europe on the basis, but if we're going to play this gutter game where we pull out the Bali bombing and we pull out examples of anti-Semitism in the Islamic community, then of course I'm going to come back and say, well, hold on. I mean, look, let's be very clear. Daniel here was a last minute replacement for Douglas Murray who had to pull out. And Douglas and I have a well-documented differences, but to be fair to Douglas, as to be fair to Anne-Marie and to Peter, atheists. Atheists see all religions as evil, violent, threatening. What the problem I have with Daniel's speech is that Daniel comes here to run this robust defense of Christianity, forgetting that his fellow Christians, people who said they were acting in the name of Jesus, gave us the Crusades, the Spanish Inquisition, the anti-Jewish pogroms, European colonialism in Africa and Asia, the Lord's Resistance Army in Uganda, not to mention countless arson and bomb attacks on abortion clinics in the United States of America to this very day. I would like a little bit of humility from Daniel first before he begins lecturing other communities and other faiths on violence, terror and intolerance. But, no thank you. Some water. Drink some water. But I would say this, to address the gentleman's very valid point here, I'm not going to play that game. I don't actually believe that Christianity is a religion of violence and hate because of what the LRA does in Uganda or what, uh, what crusaders did uh, to Jews and Muslims in Jerusalem when they took back the city in the 12th or 13th or whatever century it was. I believe that Christianity, like Islam, like pretty much every mainstream religion, is based on love and compassion and faith. I do follow a religion in which 113 out of the 114 chapters of the Quran begins by introducing the God of Islam as a God of mercy and compassion. I would not have it any other way. I don't follow a religion which introduces my my God to me as a God of war, as some kind of Greek God of wrath, uh, as a God of hate and injustice. Not at all. As Adam pointed out, you go through the Quran and you see the mercy and the love and the justice. And yes, you have verses that refer to warfare and violence. Of course it does. This is not a motion about pacifism. I'm not here to argue that Islam is a pacifistic faith. It is not. Islam allows military action, violence in certain limited contexts. And yes, a minority of Muslims do take it out of that context. But is it religious? Well, we talked about Woolwich. Daniel and Anne-Marie have suggested that it's definitely religion that's behind all of this. Well, actually, what I find so amusing tonight is we're having a debate about Islam. And the opposition tonight have come forward. We have a graduate in law, a graduate in modern history, a graduate in chemistry. Uh, and, you know, I admire all of their intellects and their abilities, but we don't have anyone who's actually a, an expert on Islam, a scholar of Islam, a historian of Islam, a speaker of Arabic, even a terrorism expert or a security expert or a pollster, let alone to talk about what Muslims believe or think. Instead, we have people coming here, putting forward these views, putting forward these sweeping opinions. Listen to Professor Robert Pape of the University of Chicago, one of America's leading terrorism 
experts, who, unlike our esteemed opposition tonight, studied every single case of suicide terrorism between 1980 and 2005, 315 cases in total. And he concluded, and I quote, there is little connection between suicide terrorism and Islamic fundamentalism or any of the world's religions. Rather, what nearly all suicide terrorist attacks have in common is a specific secular and strategic goal to compel modern democracies to withdraw military forces from territory that the terrorists consider to be their homeland. And the irony is, when we talk about terrorism, the irony is that the opposition and the Muslim terrorists, the Al-Qaeda types, actually have one thing in common because they both believe that Islam is a warlike, violent religion. They both agree on that. They have everything in common. Osama bin Laden would be nodding along to everything he's heard tonight from the opposition side. He agrees with them. The problem is, the problem is that mainstream Muslims don't. The majority of Muslims around the world don't. In fact, a gentleman here started quoting all sorts of polls. Gallup carried out the biggest poll of Muslims around the world of 35,000, 50,000 Muslims in 35 countries. 93% of Muslims rejected 9-11 and suicide attacks. And of the 7% who didn't, they all, when polled and focus grouped, cited political reasons for their support for violence, not religious reasons. And as for Islamic scholars and what they say, well, Daniel talks about our University of Oxford. We'll go down to Oxford's Centre for Islamic Studies, get hold of a man named Sheikh Afifi al-Akiti, who is a massively well-credentialed and well-respected Islamic scholar who has studied across the world, who in the days after 7-7 published a fatwa denouncing terrorism in the name of Islam, calling for the protection of all non-combatants at all times and describing suicide bombings as an innovation with no basis in Islamic law. Go and listen to Sheikh Tahir al-Qadri, one of Pakistan's most famous Islamic scholars, who published a 600-page fatwa condemning the killing of all innocents and all suicide bombings unconditionally without any ifs or buts. There's nothing new here. This is mainstream Islam, mainstream scholarship, which has said this for years. You don't go out and kill people willy-nilly in the high street or anywhere else on a bus or a mall based on verses of the Quran that you cherry pick without any context, any understanding, any interpretation or any commentary. Please. Well, it's, it's, it doesn't happen apparently. I didn't say it doesn't happen at all. I never said it didn't happen. I don't blame Islam. Yes, it's a very good point. And a lot of us, a lot of us are campaigning against that. And we're campaigning against it in the name of Islam. We're campaigning against it in the name of various interpretations of Islam. Anne-Marie comes and scares us with her talk of Sharia law. I would like to see the book of Sharia law. It doesn't exist. People argue over what Sharia law is. And you empower the extremists by saying there is only one version. You empower them all. I don't believe you Several took any interruptions, Anne-Marie, so I think you should stay there for a moment. Several countries. Here's, <laughs> here's what we're dealing with. Here's what we're countries. dealing with. We are dealing, I took your point, I took your point. Here we are dealing with a 1400 year old global religion followed by 1.6 billion people in every corner of the world, a quarter of humanity, of all backgrounds, cultures, ethnicities. And yet the opposition tonight wants to generalize, stereotype, smear in order to desperately win this debate. And here's my question, if we're going to generalize and smear. If, okay, people say yesterday's bombers and we've got to be careful, there's a trial going on, were yesterday's attackers, sorry, motivated by Islam? Big debate. I don't believe they were. Let's say they were. Let's say Faisal Shahzad, the Times Square bomber, was motivated by Islam. Let's assume for sake of argument uh, that Richard Rees, the shoe bomber, was motivated by Islam. If Islam is responsible for these killings, if Islam is what is motivating these people, and Islam is therefore not a religion of peace or religion of war, then ask yourself this question, why aren't the rest of us doing it? Why is it such a tiny minority of Muslims are interpreting their religion in the way that the opposition claim they are? Let's assume there are 16,000 suicide bombers in the world. There aren't. Let's assume there are for the sake of argument. That's 0.001% of the Muslim population globally. What about the other 99.99% of Muslims who the opposition tonight either ignore or smear? The reality is that the rest of us aren't blowing ourselves up tonight. The reality is that the opposition came here tonight not worried about the fact that me and Adam might pu pull open our jackets and blow ourselves up tonight because we're followers of a warlike warrior religion which wants to take over Europe and Daniel's university. The issue is this. <laughs> the issue is this. Unless the opposition can tell us tonight, and Peter Atkins is here, one of our great atheist intellectuals, can tell us tonight, can they can answer this question tonight, why don't the vast majority of Muslims around the world behave as violently and aggressively as a tiny minority of politically motivated extremists, then they might as well give up and stop pretending they have anything relevant to say about Islam or Muslims as a whole. Ladies and gentlemen, let me just say this to you. Think about what the opposite of this motion is. 
If you vote no tonight, think about what you're saying the opposite motion is. That Islam isn't a religion of peace, it's a religion of war, of violence, of terror, of aggression. That the people who follow Islam, me, my wife, my retired parents, my six-year-old child, that 1.8 million of your fellow British residents and citizens, that 1.6 billion people across the world, your fellow human beings, are all followers, promoters, believers in a religion of violence. Do you really think that? Do you really believe that to be the case? They say that in the Oxford Union, the most famous debate was in 1933, when Adolf Hitler looked out for the result of the king and country motion, where they voted against fighting for king and country, and Hitler was listening out for the result. Well, tonight, 80 years on, there are two groups of people around the world who I would argue are waiting for the result of tonight's vote. There are the millions of peaceful, non-violent, law-abiding Muslims, both in the UK, Europe, Asia, Africa, and beyond, who see Islam as the source of their identity, as a source of spiritual fulfillment, of hope, of solace. And there are the phobes, the haters, the bigots out there who want to push the clash of civilizations, who want to divide all of us into them and us and ours and their. Ladies and gentlemen, I urge you all not to fuel the arguments of the phobes and bigots. Don't legitimize their divisions. Don't legitimize their hate. Trust those Muslims who you know, who you've met, who you hear, who don't believe in violence, who do want you to hear the peaceful message of the Qur'an as they believe it to be taught to the majority of Muslims, the Islam of peace and compassion and mercy, the Islam of the Qur'an, not of Al-Qaeda. Ladies and gentlemen, I beg to propose this motion to the House. I urge you to vote yes tonight. Thank you very much for your time.